Hello, uh, my name is Phil Traceda. I'm the Education Officer at Swansea Museum. And this is the third talk in a series. We've had the Blitz and we've had the Mumbles Railway. And this one is the History and Treasures of Swansea Museum. Uh, this has been brought to you uh, by Swansea Museum, which is part of the City and County of Swansea, and Fusion, which is a Welsh Government cultural initiative. So the museum starts in 1835 when a group set up calling itself Swansea Philosophical and Literary Society. Um, quite soon after, they get a, a royal charter and they become the Royal Institution of South Wales. This is uh, Lewis Weston Dillwyn. Now he's the first president of uh, the Royal Institution of South Wales. Uh, he owns Swansea uh, Cambrian Pottery and uh, pro probably the richest man in Swansea at the time. So he's the first president and his interest was, well, he had various interests, but he was very keen on plants. Um, so um, that, was, that was one of his particular interests. So they become the Royal Institution of South Wales and they uh, immediately start a fundraising campaign to, um, for, the, for the building of the, of the actual museum. And it's the sort of early members of the Royal Institution and what their particular interests are form the sort of historic collections, if you like. Uh, you know, some of them were interested in natural history, some of them interested in archaeology, uh, some of them, like Lewis Weston Dill, were interested in botany. They collect what they're interested in, study them, and present them back to the to the fellow members. So. In those early days, I suppose you need to think of the museum uh, not like it is today with exhibitions and open to the public every day, but kind of more like a rich gentleman's education club. And we'll see some photographs of how the building would have looked um, yeah, shortly to give you an idea on that. So the, uh, the Royal Institution actually still runs to this day. Uh, they ran the museum right up until the late 80s. For a brief period, it was actually run by Swans University. And then it came over uh, under City and County of Swansea in, uh, in 1991. Uh, but the Royal Institution still meet at the museum. They still have uh, all, all their lectures there. And they act as a sort of friends of the museum. So, as I said, the, uh, the collection is quite vast. Um, this is the uh, donation book for 1835. The, these documents are st you know, still remain with us either in the museum or in, or in West Glamorgan archives. Uh, so this is, this is the first page of the donation book in 1835. And uh, we can't see any of that, but if we just take a close up of the donation book in 1835, we see things like this. So if you look at item 32, for example, Cyclops monstrosity of a chicken, which was brought in from Clan Ridian on the Gower. Obviously, a chicken with one eye has been born. They thought, oh, that's interesting, uh, worth studying and looking at. Uh, the next item in, item 33, is a bicephalus. Now, it doesn't, now that means something with two heads. Those grammar marks would indicate it's another chicken. And this has been brought in from Swansea, quite um, quite odd. One-eyed chicken and a two-headed chicken uh, coming in next to each other. But then uh, this is 1835, so pollution levels are starting to build up in Swansea with the various metalworks at this point. The next item in is an adder, but as you can see, it's from St. Petersburg uh, in Russia. And the next item then, number 35, is a scorpion from Cuba. They collect in various things of interest to them from, you know, local and from across the world. Now, the fact that these were donated doesn't mean that they were kept. And in fact, um, none of these items were kept. They were probably studied. Um, Cyclops monstrosity, the chicken, maybe ended up in the caretaker's dog. So none of these items were actually kept. They were studied, you know, present their findings back to their fellow members. And this is before the museum is built, so they haven't got much storage space at this point. If a, muse a museum object was considered to be important, then it was what we call accessioned into the collection. So if an object is accessioned into the museum collection, then you know it stays there. 
So we can see this is the first page of the accession register. And we can see on the left, top left, it says A835.1. And underneath in pencil, you can see SM1835.1. Now that numbering system is what we'd still use at the museum. So the 1835 indicates the year it has come into the museum collection. Dot one in this case would be, it's the first object in, in 1835. And it's an inscribed stone and it's a Latin inscription. It's difficult to get a um, good photograph of it, uh, but uh, this is this is the object itself. And you could still see this. This object is currently sitting in the corridor of the museum. And it's a Roman milestone. It was found near Pyle at uh, Bridge End, and it would have been on the road between the fort at Neath and another fort, which is the location's kind of lost, but um, near Cowbridge. So the Swansea Philosophical Literary Society uh, get a royal charter to become the Royal Institution of South Wales, and they immediately embark on a fundraising campaign to raise the money for the uh, for the building of the museum. Uh, this is a share certificate that was issued at the time, so a kind of fundraising effort, a bit like a company share certificate, but obviously you're not going to get any money back on this. It's uh, more for sort of charitable purposes. When you when you look at that share certificate, obviously that that's an artist's impression of what the museum's going to look like, and uh, it looked a bit more elegant in the artist's mind than in reality. This is the actual museum in uh, 1848 that the Royal Institutions come together for a meeting in um, in Swansea and it's a lot about science in these days you know you would have had scientists coming together uh, Faraday would have been demonstrating some electricity um, uh, science at the, at the museum you would have had people like uh, William Grove who was a scientist in Swansea experimenting with things called fuel cells the nearest equivalent you could say to it these days would be a battery. And uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was working on the theory of evolution at pretty much the same time as Darwin, uh, worked on the Vale of Neath Railway. And he would have been in Swansea Museum doing some of his research. And of course, this is what the museum looks like today. Uh, you know, As you can see, some very nice steps leading up to the front door there. Um, quite famous steps really and uh, if you um, don't get that joke I'm sure some if you ask uh, some older resident of Swansea they will explain. The museum is you know one of a few sites we have uh, this is the storage the old copper rolling mill up in uh, Landau so if you drive into the park and ride opposite the Liberty Stadium uh, this is where a lot of the um, uh, transfer the vehicles the boats some of the machinery etc kept um, so we have a huge storage as you'd expect with a with a sort of old museum with a big collection uh, when you visit the museum you're probably only looking at 20 percent of the collection at any one time and around the corner there's the tram shed for further information there was a there's another talk online that you can find on the mumbles railway and this uh, tram shed is open uh, usually on a wednesday and saturday Volunteers open it, so um, but you know, just if you want to visit, just check with the museum, just ring the museum first. And most of the objects related to the Mumbles Railway are, are in the tram shed. Uh, obviously, the historic significance with the Mumbles Railway was that it was the first passenger railway in the world. So, some images of what the museum looks like. This is uh, this is a room you can't see as you walk into the museum, and if you uh, you see the Behind reception, there's a big set of doors which are closed, and this is uh, this is my office. Um, you think the Lord Mayor would probably have the nicest office in Swansea, but no, the Education Officer of the Museum is the nicest office. Um, unfortunately, I do have to share it with a few people. Uh, but this is this is a room that you would only see if you were one of the volunteers or if you booked a research appointment to come into the museum. But this particular office actually originally would have looked like this. Originally, it's the reference library for the Royal Institution of South Wales. As you walk into the museum and you go to your left, uh, then the exhibition room there uh, looks very different now. But originally, the 
uh, what we call the lecture theatre was an actual proper lecture theatre with tiered benches. Uh, so the speaker would come through the side door which in the corridor and the floor level originally would have been the back uh, level of the corridor and where you come into the museum and you turn left into that temporary exhibition space you would have been walking down steps through the tiered seating. Um, so about 1900 they leveled it off um, and unfortunately they didn't take a picture but they leveled it off to the front entrance level so if you were to if you see the door in the just in the right hand corner there if you come up through the door up the steps you, and you look to the left you'd notice a little um, hatchway and if you open that and you crawl under the floorboards you'll find the first three four rows of benches uh, original benches are still in fact there um, so the whole place probably would have held well certainly 250 people maybe more um, but you know very kind of narrow probably quite uncomfortable benches which is probably why they leveled it off and if you were to go into the cellar of the museum and it's quite difficult to get a good picture of this but um, you've got these semi-circular stone walls increasing in height and that is the structure underneath in the cellar which was propping up the whole lecture theatre above. So, as I said, a lot of what it was about was, was pretty much on science base rather than history in those days. So if we look at a lecture programme here, one of the earlier sort of lecture programmes, then we can see things like on the conditions of human life and health on heat with experimental illustrations, uh, on the connection between religion and science, on diseases and remedies. And my favorite one, if you, uh, if you just looked uh, down the right hand side towards the bottom, are the planets probably inhabited worlds? So they were looking at all kinds of um, you know, sci scientific issues. This now is the main exhibition space, temporary exhibition space in the museum. Currently we've got a lot of natural history out in this in this particular room but originally it was the reading rooms, um, library and reading rooms. So this is a this is a picture of that room um, probably about uh, 1900 and if you were to look back the other way you would then go up the steps there and then into the re, uh, into the reference library that has been partitioned off now and uh, created into created into an office so so if you if you imagine the original building the ground floor there's nothing really much on display at all uh, you've got a lecture theater a reference library and the main library and reading rooms at this point, the um, education room wouldn't have been there and neither would have been the room which we now keep the ceramics in. And this is a picture of what it, how it looks today. Um, this is from a, a music exhibition um, quite a number of years ago now, probably about 10 years ago. And you can see that that has been blocked off now. And uh, that's Terry Williams' drum kit, as in Terry Williams and Dire Straits then. So this is the art gallery. This is a, an extension early, um, early 20th century. And today it looks like this. It's the, um, it's the ceramics gallery. A couple of other pictures of how the museum used to look. This is one of the rooms upstairs. The main gallery upstairs was two different rooms. The huge sort of stuffed bird collection was kept in one of them. Unfortunately, the museum didn't have probably adequate storage facilities. In fact, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, natural history samples are actually kept in the cellar. And of course, the temperature and humidity were not, uh, were not good. So quite a number of these um, specimens, unfortunately, being lost. We still have a significant um, bird collection, but quite a few have been lost over the years. And also lost, unfortunately, and you probably need to be getting on a bit now to remember Lizzie the elephant and uh, she stood in the entranceway to the uh, museum 
you know, where she's standing has been turned into a cupboard. And that, that this photograph you can see above the door of the cupboard as you come into the museum. She was not a fully grown elephant, she was a teenage elephant, if you like. And uh, she was part of a travelling circus. And um, she died up near Llandilo in the 1880s. So they managed to bring her back to Swansea, which is kind of no mean feat in those days. Had her stuffed, which was probably a bit of a shock and a surprise to the uh, taxidermist in Swansea. Probably not quite used to dealing with something this size and she was placed here. Of course, the problem was is that she's right at the entrance. So the temperature and humidity, um, it's one thing, it, you know, it being at the wrong level. Uh, worse still, if the temperature and humidity are going up and down. And uh, unfortunately, by the sort of 1930s, she was kind of deteriorating quite badly. And um, eventually she was she was burnt in the garden in the late 50s. There was a story at the time that I used to tell when I do, when doing this talk that during the Blitz, doors were blown in and one of them landed on Lizzie the Elephant. Um, it turned out that's not true. But as a result, various objects were moved for safekeeping uh, in a, as a bit of an emergency during the Second World War. Quite a number of objects were placed in Kambulla School um, and forgotten about. They were having these cases in the hall replaced because they were... They were glass, so the school contacted that was about 10 years ago. They didn't know where these objects had come from, and um, one day the headmaster happened to be talking to one of the grandparents who told him that all these objects came from the museum for safekeeping during the war. So we went up and collected these objects, and there was about 30 objects, and we brought back, and um, this is just the, the most interesting object brought back. Now, there are a pair of boots, obviously a pair of women's boots, uh, but they've been made in China. But of course, they've been made for a woman who's had a feet bound. Nice object, but quite horrible. So some of the uh, some of the treasures of Swansea Museum, obviously Swansea pottery is uh, quite famous, well collected. Uh, this is the earliest dated piece of Swansea pottery. Morgan John was a freeman, and uh, it's dated 1768. It's it's just a, fl a flask. Something a bit more elaborate. This is um, not made in Swansea, but for a Swansea family. This is a Wenny. Uh, a Wenny pottery is actually quite close to Bridge End and, and still runs to this day. This is um, a wassail bowl, and um, basically it's a punch bowl. The Swansea Museum has two collections that you might consider to be internationally significant. One is early Victorian photography and the other is Ice Age archaeology out of the Gower Caves. So, in terms of photography, uh, this is um, John Dillwyn through Ellen. He is related to Fox Talbot through marriage, and he gets into photography at quite an early stage, and, and quite a few people in um, Swansea do. Um, now, we have 13 of his photograph albums, plus various other photographs uh, which are loose, and uh, this is a self-portrait. Some other members of the family were also into the photography, and this is by his daughter, Teresa Llewellyn. She's more interested in taking photographs of kind of people. John Dillwyn Llewellyn is more interested in sort of landscapes. This is a, a lovely photo of the upper lake in Pentlegare. Obviously, they're restoring the lakes and the gardens up there at the moment. Part of the reason they know how they should be restored is, is because we have these photograph albums of them. You know, he takes a very nice picture as as well as it being very early photography. A couple of the photographs over the years have gone on international exhibitions previously to places like Paris and New York. This is a, a later photograph, but, it, you know, it also means that we do have some very nice photographs of Swansea and how it looked. Uh, this one is, a lot of people immediately think it's High Street because they see the Mackworth Hotel, but in fact it's actually Wine Street. You kind of roughly, just by the sort of uh, no sign year, looking up Wine Street. And uh, there was a building called the Island House in the middle of Wine Street there, but um, that was knocked down to make way for the um, tram lines. Another photographer was the Reverend Calvin Jones, and uh, he's very much into taking uh, photographs uh, maritime. Quite a number of his photographs are in the uh, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. This one you can see, now this is taken in the 1840s, and we know that because 
this is the original river coming around the strand. This is before they redirect the river down the new cut and they create a dock here called North Dock. Now, North Dock, very few people would, would be able to remember it now. It was mostly filled in with rubble from the Blitz. It's still tidal, um, so the, you know, the ships are coming in and they're sitting in the mud when the tide has gone out. This is one of Henry Bath's ships. They owned um, a shipping company. Some of these ships they used to name after um, the Greek alphabet, as in Alpha, Beta, Zeta. And it's one of his ships, actually, that Catherine Zeta-Jones gets her name from. Her great-grandfather would have been the captain of the Zeta. He named his daughter Zeta, and that's Catherine, uh, you know, she's named after her grandmother. Like I said, the other um, internationally significant collection is all the various things that have come out of the Gower Caves. This is a humerus bone of a woolly rhinoceros, obviously long extinct now. Uh, this is a jawbone of a wolf. A couple of other items of interest. This is a water ewer. It's, it's in the archaeology gallery upstairs. This belonged to um, the 8th Earl of Gloucester, Gilbert de Clare. He obviously was having trouble with things being stolen off him because the inscription you can see on it uh, is in Norman French. And if you were to uh, translate it, it roughly says, uh, I am the ewer of Gilbert de Clare. He who carry me off may he suffer evil. So we kind of assume he was having things stolen off him. Obviously this was stolen because it turned up in a, f in, in, in a field in the Gower. We don't know what happened to the person who stole it. Gilbert de Clare, well, he certainly suffered evil. He was killed by the Scots at the Battle of Bannockburn. A floor tile from Neath Abbey. Again, people might remember that probably during the 70s, the Royal Institution used to use this image as the kind of logo. And we have various uh, other collections like costume. Include this particular piece uh, of the dress, the shawl and the bonnet. All belonged to my grandmother. It was donated to the museum back in 1991 by my mother. Uh, my grandmother was born in 1900. Um, but the dress has been dated to about 1850. So it was several hand-me-downs even before my grandmother got it. Uh, again, some social history. We have quite a collection of things like toys, dolls. Swansea Museum doesn't have a big art collection. Uh, obviously, you've got the uh, Glyn Vivian as well. So as a museum, we concentrate on sort of landscape paintings and prints of Swansea and also sort of portraits of, of people of Swansea. Uh, this is a maritime scene which has been painted by Harris Senior. And there was a Harris Junior and a Harris Senior, both pretty good um, maritime artists. But um, if you've got a, a maritime picture by Harris Senior, then it's going to be worth a bit more money, money than Harris Junior. Harris Senior was the better artist. You can see a, a view of Swansea here. And just in case you're wondering where that is, uh, the clue is the church there on the left. Uh, that is All Saints at, uh, at Oystermouth. We also have some nice prints, which include this one, which I quite like. It's the bathing house. This is 1790. And at this moment in time, the um, I suppose the great and the good and the elders of Swansea saw tourism as the future. You would come to Swansea to take the waters and look at the lovely scenery. This is the bathing house and you can see the bathing machines, which would have taken the people into into the water. And I suppose things come full circle in a way, because this is now the site of the Civic Centre. Plans are afoot maybe to um, sell that site for, for tourism development. And uh, probably uh, a, a most famous painting now is this. It's a painting about Atlanta and Melagea. It's sort of Greek uh, mythology. It's a, it's a bit of a long, complicated story I won't go into, but um, this was in the storage on the art racks. About seven or eight years ago, a project started where the sort of public art foundation, they, they decided to photograph every oil painting uh, in a public collection and put them online. This resulted in sort of art historians looking at some of these paintings and uh, a BBC program started called Lost Masterpieces. This is, I think it was the first program um, and they kind of spotted this and thought, hmm, 
Now, what he got here is, you now we know it's probably a fairly old painting because it's oil on five wooden panels. So you can see um, those lines running across of the sort of wooden panels. And it was recorded as after Jacob Jordan's, so in the style of Jacob Jordan's, who was a Dutch master. It was just something that wasn't on display. It had an insurance valuation, I think, nine and a half thousand. They decided they wanted to check this out and uh, they looked into it. Of course, after some uh, considerable research, they discovered it was by Jacob Jordans after all. And it went off for conservation and it, and it come back and you can see it's overpaint in it that has been done over the years, has been taken off, it's been thoroughly cleaned and you can no longer see the um, see the lines going across where the panels were splitting. So it, uh, yes, it turned out to be by him uh, rather than in the style of. And so um, it came back and it's now on display upstairs with the insurance valuation adjusted somewhat. I suppose the most iconic object in the museum is, is the mummy, Hor, that's H-O-R. He was a high priest. And the rest of the Egyptian collection was, came back to Swansea in the, in the 1880s. And he's been on display in the museum ever since. It was a time when he was on uh, halfway up the stairs and just opened, so people used to touch his toe for good luck. Well, can't do that anymore. I'm just going to finish with this object. As you can see, it's a biscuit barrel. Lots of people will think, well, I've got one of those in my house, or certainly my, uh, my parents or my grandparents have certainly got one of these. Kind of think that... Um, you know, most of the museum objects from the, from the 19th century and that maybe we've uh, stopped collecting objects. Well, that's not the case with the museum. And we're going to come back to the biscuit barrel at the start of the next talk, uh, which will be uh, called Carry On Collecting. In 1991, the museum transferred over from the Royal Institution of South Wales that set it up over to the city and county of Swansea. But of course, we still collect objects we probably take in several hundred, hundred objects a year in donations. But before we come running in with a biscuit barrel for us, um, hold off and uh, we'll pick up the story at the next talk. Just a reminder, if you want to come in and you want to have a look around the museum and you've got young children, uh, no problem. Just ask for a, house, a mouse hunt sheet at the uh, at the front desk, and your children will go running around the museum looking for mice, and uh, that'll give you a chance to have a look at the uh, objects and take in some of Swansea's heritage. <laughs>